the opportunity for us to just be really close together this morning, Father. And with the few changes that are going on this morning, may we be free from distraction, even with this little fly flying around my face, Father. <laughs> I praise you, Lord, because it's the little things that just make us laugh. And God, I just praise you, and I just ask that that little fly or anything else just not be a distraction to us this morning, God. So thank you so much for everything, Father, and I praise you, and I pray that you speak through Bob this morning, God. Thank you so much for everybody that's here, Father. In your son's beautiful name, I pray. Amen. I'm not sure everything you said was true, but, you know, in the church, I can't challenge you. <laughs> He's your pastor. Um, a couple years ago, we were having lunch, Alex, um, I think most of you know Brother Martinez, Edgardo Martinez, and Jim Cleveland. We were going to lunch. This I remember this is, took maybe even three years ago. And uh, Alex looks over to me and he says, Bob, won't you come out and preach? Well, first of all, I don't know if preach is the right word, but uh, I said, give me a time. I felt he was bluffing, you know. And uh, sure enough, not another word was said until about two months ago. We're again going out to lunch, and he he says, "Why haven't you been out to preach?" Now, personally, I cannot fathom walking in that door on a Sunday morning, asking him to sit down and say, "I'm going to preach." Right? Uh, I just can't fathom that, but. Uh, a couple weeks ago, he did call and asked me to come and speak. Uh, you notice I use the word speak instead of preach because basically uh, most of this will be my testimony of what the Lord's done for me. And uh, if you can go and put that, that first slide up there, uh, what I, I really want to look at today, and sorry if you okay. Uh, is is talking about in my life there's been myths and I've been having peace in the midst of storms in my life and so I want to look at a couple stories today from scripture and then kind of throw in personal testimony uh, as he has asked me to do about my life and how the Lord has led me Let's bow our heads in prayer before we get into God's Word. Lord, we do thank you for everything that you've done for us, for the blessings we've received, for the times when we have not deserved it, but you have taken care of us. Lord, we thank thee for Brother DiMatteo, his life, for the work he has done here at Oasis. We thank thee for everyone that's here. And we pray now that you would bless our time as we look in your word and I share with each one of these what you have done for me. Again, bless our time together before we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to take a couple of my favorite stories from God's word and apply them and show how it has affected my life and how the stories really have drawn me closer to him. The first one I want to look at is in 1 Kings chapter 18, we have the story of a man of God named Elijah. Elijah was one of God's prophets. He loved the Lord. He was, he was a man who was faithful to the Lord. He would stand up to anybody, had courage. And he asked Ahab, who was kind of the right-hand man to Jezebel there, he asked him to bring all the children of Israel up to Mount Carmen. And he told them also to bring the prophets of Baal, of which there were probably 450 or even more. And he told them to bring them up because he wanted to teach them the children of Israel wanted to teach Sorry, Bob. Them. That's all right. <laughs> he wanted to teach them who the true God was, who the one they should be serving. And so he gets up on the mountain, all the people, he got two bullocks there. 
And what he did was give one to the prophets and told them, build yourself an altar, put wood on it, kill the bullock, prepare it for sacrifice, and don't light the fire. What I want you to do is I want you to pray to your gods, pray to Baal, ask him to bring a fire for the sacrifice. And uh, so they did. They prayed from morning until noon. They continued to pray at noon. Now Elijah, he, he was, I would have to say he was a character too because around noon he started mocking them, laughing at them, you know, uh, just saying, what's wrong? Is your, is your God asleep? They continued to pray. Even, even cutting themselves, which was a sign at that time of complete dedication to their gods. And so they, they prayed until the evening. When the evening sacrifice would come, no fire. Elijah went and got 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel, built himself an altar there of stone, put the wood upon the altar, got his bullock, cut it, made it ready for sacrifice, built a big trench around the altar. Then he told his servant, go get barrels, four barrels full of water, and pour on the altar. It covered the bullock, it covered the wood, it covered the stone did that three times, a total of 12 big barrels of water, and just poured it on. And then he sat down and prayed to the Lord. We pick it up where he says, Hear me, O Lord, hear me that this people may know that thou art the God, that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice in the wood and the stones and the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench. And I love this verse. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, He is God. You see, He demonstrated and He proved to the people of Israel that He was God. And you might say He was having a mountaintop spiritual experience. But it didn't stop then. We see later he goes up on the mountain there and and he rain. They hadn't had rain in ages. And he calls upon the Lord. He gets on his knees at the top of the Mount Carmen and he prays for rain. He sends his servant, go look out over the sea there, over the Sea of Galilee. See if you see anything. Six times the servant came back and said there's nothing but then the seventh time the servant came and there was a cloud about the size of a fist over the sea there Ahab jumped I mean uh, Elijah jumped up he said go tell Ahab to get in his chariot take off back to Jezreel because it's coming it's coming and sure enough it did as it says in God's Word, chapter 18, verse 44 through 46, came to pass, they said, Behold, there arises a little cloud like a man's hand. Prepare thy chariot and get thee down. And it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah. You know, I look at uh, I look at these stories here, and I think what a great experience! What a great experience Elijah had. He was on top of the world spiritually. He, what can you say other than a great mountain top spiritual experiences are often followed by the valley. Satan never gets quits trying, does he? At least in my life he hasn't. And I'm sure you can say that in your life. What happens next? 
is that he goes down and he finds that Jezebel wants to kill him. See, after such a great spiritual experience, you would think that he had so much spirituality in him that nothing could faze him, right? But what he did was he panicked and took off, ran and hid from Jezebel there. He did not want to be killed. He went into depression. These verses, and when you read uh, in 1 Kings chapter 19 there, uh, you see in these verses uh, uh, a classic, uh, a classic someone with depression. And it gives you some good ideas related to how to get over depression. I'm not a clinical psychologist, so I'm certainly not going to try to tell you how to get over depression. But here was Elijah. He slept. He wouldn't eat. But what happened? The Lord took care of him, didn't he? In verses, uh, uh, go on the next slide there. Uh, as he lay and slept, an angel touched him, arise and eat. See, the angel of the Lord came and, and took care of him. And he was able to follow the Lord's leading after that. You know, we look at it, and what I've shown you here is a great mountaintop experience. Last month, my wife and I, along with 20-something others, went on a mission trip to... Uh, Columbia, South America. We went to the beautiful island of San Andres, Columbia, which is off the uh, shore of Panama and Nicaragua. And uh, it was a tremendous time of spiritual uh, happening. The little church there uh, had vacation Bible school, I think, for the first time. I'm not sure. They wanted it. It's been 10 years since they'd had vacation Bible school. They were hoping for the entire week to reach 100 kids. They ended up reaching 113. But what amazed me even more was the number of volunteers they had. The people came from that church, came out wanting to do something there. They had evangelistic brother Edgardo Martinez. Uh, by the way, that's his home island. That's where he's from. Uh, he preached a wonderful sermon about God's love. Brother Ronald Hooker, who is also from that island, tremendous evangelistic souls were saved. Lives were rededicated to the Lord. A house was rebuilt for a, a widow there who was living with her daughter and granddaughter in just two rooms of the entire house because the rest was in such disrepair that they couldn't live in it. We, not me, I'm afraid to say, but the group rebuilt the house to the glory of God. We had the opportunity, my wife and I and Brother Hooker had the opportunity to go visit shut-ins who weren't able to go to the meetings or anything. One was a 99-year-old blind lady love the Lord her birthday is two days after mine and I'm looking forward to communicating with her even just through sending her uh, best wishes on her hundredth birthday we visited another one 95 years old and brother Hooker said what uh, song would you like me to read he said well let's start with Psalm 23 and the guy quoted it we didn't even have the chance to read and then he said, well, let's go to Psalm, I believe it was 91. And he started quoting that. We didn't even have a chance to minister to him. We ministered to another man who was also 95, who had been the piano player for all his, all his adult life there on the island, at First Baptist, at Mount Zion, another church. In other words, we experienced a spiritual, just a, the freedom of the Lord. And it was great. I'll be truthful with you. I was, I'm not going to speak for my wife, but I was on a spiritual high when we came back. 
on a spiritual high, but on a physical low, because we were totally exhausted. Saturday morning, uh, well, Saturday night, we boarded the plane in Bogota for, um, for the States. We got into El Paso at 7 o'clock in the morning. Let's go on the next slide, if you could, please. And uh, I, was, I was thinking about this because of some other things I'll tell you a little later. And we get in our car and go into Carlsbad, New Mexico, to pick up our granddaughter. Every year she has come to vacation Bible school. And we so desperately wanted to have her because that's the only spiritual training she gets. See, they don't go. My stepdaughter, Rita's daughter, his, uh, and her husband, they don't go to church. And so little Samantha really doesn't get any spiritual training. We wanted so desperately to do that for our granddaughter. Right on the other side of Guadalupe Peak, the car got out of control, and that's where we ended up. Um, that was a difficult time, you might say. I had some people that came by, helped me out of the car. Rita was dangling, you know, sideways on the seatbelt. A lady, a military lady, came and sat down on the ground there and held her hand, held Rita's head in her hand so she could relax. Uh, it, was, it was tremendous the help we got and the ambulance took us to Carlsbad uh, Medical Center. They gave, did all sorts of tests on our head, back, uh, x-rays, CT scans, etc., etc. And then the guy, the doctor, the emergency room doctor comes in and says, um, nothing wrong with you, you can go. And we walked out of that place. And I thought so much about that. The Lord realized that I was the weaker of the two of us. I, I kind of blacked out before we started rolling. So I really don't remember rolling. I just kind of remember uh, as the car came to a stop being kind of in there. But Rita has te testified to me, and I believe that she'll back this up, that it was such a peaceful experience for her. She said as she was rolling, she counted them, three rolls. She said she didn't hear anything, no metal crunching. Everything was just peaceful as she rolled there. And we've, and we've often thought there that the Lord was with us. Now, the angels, and by the way, that was a total loss, believe me. You know, uh, the angels helped us. What does he say in Psalm 91, 11? But he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. You see, some people believe in a guardian angel. I think there's uh, Bible support for that, but I also think, I don't believe that I've got a guardian angel. I believe the Lord sends a bunch of angels to help me. And he certainly did at that time. You know, the Lord took us from a spiritual experience, a to me a tremendous one, took us in the valley, but what did we have? We had peace. We had peace within that storm. Another one of my favorite stories is about an actual storm. It's over in uh, Matthew chapter 14 where Jesus had gone in the mountain and was with his disciples. And the multitude was there. The disciples wanted to send them away. But he said, no, let's keep them. Let's keep them here. He healed the sick. He taught them. And then the disciples told Jesus, you know, these people are hungry now. You need to feed them. And Jesus said, what do we have around? Five loaves and two fishes. You remember the story, I'm sure, where he fed the multitude. 
And today, they're on that mountain, traditional mountain where it is. They have churches built up around there. We were able to see that. And, and they call it the Mount of the, of the Loaves and Fishes there. And then after that, Jesus went to the mountaintop to pray and send his disciples into the ship to go to the, um, to, to, excuse me, to go across the Sea of Galilee ahead of him. That night, they went out there. Now, as I said, we were fortunate enough to take a Holy Land cruise back in 2011, and we were we were at the Sea of Galilee here. And I asked the, our tour guide about storms, and he said, "Look around you. You see the high mountains and the mountain that separates them from Syria." He says, "The winds will come down off the mountain." We experience the same thing here in El Paso. The winds will sweep down, and one side will be peaceful, the other side gets the winds, and that's what happens. He said it'll come suddenly, and it'll be a terrific storm on the Sea of Galilee there, and the waves come. And he said there have been many wrecked boats there. And so what happens, the, the storm came. The disciples were were scared, frightened. After this spiritual experience they had just gone through, seeing what God had done, they had lost their focus. And what happened to them? They were frightened. And then they were scared even more. And I, and I think each one of us would be to see a figure walking toward them on the, on the sea there. Yes, they were frightened, but he calmed them. You know Peter, brash Peter, he had to walk, didn't he? Oh, no. If you're Lord, let me walk out there. And so he walked toward Jesus and took his eyes off Jesus and began to sink. And Jesus took his hand. Something I've always thought about and uh, is that they had to get back in the boat, didn't they? So I think Peter walked right alongside Jesus on that water back in the boat. And as soon as they got into the ship there, there was peace. The storm lifted. Once again, there was peace in the middle of the storm. When they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. Peace in the midst of the storm. You know, the disciples learned some valuable lessons that day, which I, I believe can really apply to us. They couldn't see Jesus, but you think about it, the whole time Jesus could see them. They were in the middle of this storm here. They couldn't see Jesus. They were frightened. But He was there with them the whole time. He could see them. And you know, for the disciples, it was much easier. And for us, it's much easier to focus on the storms, isn't it? We focus on the storm in our lives, and, and we lose focus of Jesus. We take our eyes off of Him. But they also had to realize that He had been faithful to them, and He expected them to exercise their faith. Would you indulge me as I spend a few minutes on a personal testimony of another storm in my life? In 2004, yeah. well, let's go on to the next slide because I, whenever I'm giving my testimony, I always want to begin with two statements. I've been abundantly blessed of the Lord since before my birth. Lord knew me before my birth until this very moment, this very second. But I also have last stage prostate cancer, which is metastasized to various bones in my, in my body. Now, I've had people tell me, you cannot say that both are true. Either you've been blessed and you don't have cancer, 
or you have cancer and you sure can't say you've been blessed. Well, I contend that both are true there. In 2004, I developed uh, pain in my left side, uh, started experiencing uh, back spasms and such as that. Uh, now, for those who do know me, they know I didn't stop doing anything, playing softball. Uh, I had always wanted to play softball until I was 60, and I was doing that. And uh, Rita and I went to Europe with a group from church there, and uh, all the while with, with the pain. Well, in 2005, it really began to get difficult there. Uh, playing softball one Saturday night, I leaned over to stop the ball and I could feel it crack. Um, it, it hurt. Now, I'm not too smart sometime and, and just as my wife last night prayed that I would start learning my priorities, um, <laughs> you know, um, I continued and finished the game of softball. I mean, that's just the way I am. Um, but I uh, went to the doctor. Uh, taught Sunday school the next morning and one of the doctors in the class ordered uh, me to go get a blood test the next day. Now for those of you who are familiar with a PSA, it's a PSA test that kind of gives you some indication of whether in your prostate or not you, you have cancer or not. The, the normal is zero to four. Comes to find out mine was 48. And the next time I had it, the following week, it was up to 52. Of course, they immediately took uh, some t tests, x-rays, and found a, a big mass on the neck of my femur here, uh, between the, the hip ball and, and the femur. Uh, they put me, Dr. Craig Cameron, some of you may have known him, he was a member of, of uh, Coronado Baptist and was an orthopedic oncology uh, surgeon. I, he put me on crutches and once again I taught my class at, uh, at church that Sunday. We were downstairs at that time and with the crutches going up the steps I made it to next to the last and I fell and uh, split the neck of the femur just where I cracked it playing softball it went on and, and split it uh, pretty, pretty good. Now, I contend that the Lord pushed me, but uh, I don't really, you know, uh, maybe I'll find out someday if he really did so or not. Uh, I contend that because I couldn't get in to have a biopsy for two weeks. That was the next time I was scheduled to do it, to have a biopsy. And I believe that the Lord pushed me because they found out I did have cancer maybe two weeks earlier and we don't know how much difference that would have made. Of course, I'm at the hospital. Dr. Cameron does surgery, uh, replaces the hip ball here, and I have titanium down to a couple inches in my uh, left leg couple inches from my knee and my left leg here. Uh, they gave me some treatments and uh, I was fine for a couple years and then things took off. As we say, it came back with a vengeance. Had a doctor here in El Paso who um, uh -oh, gave me radiation. I had radiation on my leg, had it on my, uh, on my hip area here. And uh, the doctor here really wanted to give me a, an experimental thing. As my wife and I were reading the requirements to take this, it said no, no supplements whatsoever. Now my dad started me on vitamins when I was a little kid and there was no way I was going to give up my vitamins. So we told him no. We asked him uh, in this particular situation because it was already last stage and it was spreading uh, throughout the, the bones in my body there, uh, what, what we could look for. And he simply said that less than 12 months, you, you have about that much time 
to live. Um, I went to another doctor, my urologist, and in, I mentioned what uh, this other doctor had said, and he said, my advice to you would be to get your affairs in order. Just like that, you know. Uh, I've got to admit that here we were in a great storm in our lives, and yes, my wife and I had a, a big cry. It wasn't a little one. We cried for quite a while during that time. But at the same time, we knew the Lord was with us. Some people at the church had been to a place in Chicago, a Block Center for Integrative Cancer Treatment. And they recommended go there, checked it out, got an appointment, went up there, and they started treating me. They started treating not just my whole body, nutrition. Uh, I kept arguing with them, I don't need to lose weight. They said, no, that's fine, you go on this diet we give you. If you need to lose weight, you will. If you don't, fine. Well, I lost 20, 25 pounds. Uh, what I didn't realize that in, during this time, I shrunk. Now, I never, I wasn't quite your pastor's size, but I was two or three inches taller than I am today. And so, naturally, I was too heavy. First thing they did was order some more radiation on my spine because it had spread to my spine. And they put me on a, a round taxotere, docetaxel, um, it's, uh, it's a strong chemotherapy. They say that it shouldn't have more than nine rounds of it because it's just with neuropathy and what it does to you. Um, and so I came back and the doctor just kind of made fun of them. Said they didn't know, really know what they were doing. It wasn't going to help in everything. So I continued to go to Chicago every three weeks for treatment until we just financially couldn't do it any longer. Of course, the, we didn't like this doctor by that time, so we fired our doctor and, and got another one. And what we found out was you cannot imagine, you can't even begin to imagine the number of prayers that we received. The entire church found out. I got a call from somebody I never heard of out of town just <clears throat> telling me that they were praying for me. I was amazed. They had, you know, heard about it. My local doctor, Dr. Sanchez, who is still my um, oncology doctor, <clears throat> she continued me on Taxotere. I went up to 52 rounds of chemotherapy. Now once again, not recommended more than nine. And the neuropathy and other things were really beginning to take its toll. And she finally said, look, you, the cancer has not spread, nor has it gotten bigger in a few months now. Let's drop off of it. And you know something? I didn't want to drop off of it. I mean, we were having success. Hey, I could take all the other stuff, I thought. So anyway, we dropped off of it. And that was about four or five years ago. Now, you see me doing this a lot. That's still from that chemotherapy. It, it affects something up here to where my nose and my eyes constantly run. And uh, I do everything I can to catch up with it. And I, it just doesn't help. But you see how the Lord has blessed me there? Every four months, three or four months, I, I still have tests. I had tests, uh, what was it, two weeks ago. And once again, they still see the spots where the cancer was. So I can't say that I've been quote-unquote healed, but the prayers have been answered where they're still dormant. They have, there's been no change in them on my spine, on the shoulder blade, on the rib, and on the hip area. 
The Lord has been good, hasn't He? He has given me peace. He has given, I believe, my wife peace in the midst of, of this storm in our lives here. And He's been good to us. Now, now you see, I can, I can say I do not know what the future holds. I could have the tests in four months from now and it may have started again. We had a scare about, what was it, about three months ago and they had to do a, a needle biopsy on a place on my spine and the doctors told me it was cancer, you know, and get through of it. It wasn't cancer, it was something else. You know, I do not recommend a needle biopsy on your spine to any of you. But the Lord, once again, was gracious and watched over me and gave us the peace in the midst of the storm. You know, I tell people this and they laugh and maybe some of you will and, and maybe um, uh, don't believe me, but I honestly, from the depths of my heart, thank the Lord for the cancer he gave me and has given me for a number of reasons. One of which he has taught me to rely on him. Let's go, let's go to the next slide here. Uh, he's given me verses to rely on over in Proverbs. Familiar verses. We all know them, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding in all thy ways. Acknowledge Him and He shall direct thy paths. 1 Peter 5, 7. This has been a verse that I learned as a, as a little kid right after John 3, 16. And it's been in my life casting all your care upon Him but He careth for you. I look in the mirror every morning and I shudder. And I look, I am so thankful that when, when the Lord takes me, I'm going to have a new body. It's going to be a perfect body. A lot different than this thing that I'm in right now. And the insides are going to be perfect. And I thank the Lord. I've got a hope. You see, I say a hope. Go to the next slide here. I, see, I learned some lessons just like the disciples did. There have been times when I certainly couldn't see Jesus in the middle of my storm here, but He saw me, He was with me, and He was caring for me. It was easier to focus on my problems, you know, when I should have been focused on Lord Jesus Christ there. But God's been faithful to me in the past. He's going to continue to be faithful to me in now and in the future. And I can learn that it's only through His strength that I can minister. Everything accomplished needs to give all praise and glory to the Lord there. A few months ago, a close friend of ours who now lives in College Station, uh, I guess 20 years ago, uh, a man named Chris Whitworth was with us over at Emmanuel Baptist Church there and I was talking to him on the phone he was telling me about how he was uh, what he was doing he was working with the Texas Baptist uh, disaster relief teams uh, he would man the phones when uh, the old Billy Graham Crusades would come on he would man the phones for them and I said man where are you getting your energy and everything? You see, back a number of years before my storm came along, he was diagnosed with a tumor in his brain. When they operated, they could not get all of it. It was just too dangerous. And like it did with me, the doctors did not give him a long time to live there. And also, like me, the doctors didn't consult the Lord and let the Lord decide. He is still faithful. Chris is still faithful. He is in there. And I said, what? He wrote me an email back, a long email. He said, the Lord has given me a verse that has been 
with me and enabled me. It's 1 Peter 4.11. If we could change the slide there, if you would, please. It says, if any man speak, let him speak the oracles of God. In other words, when we talk to others and witness to others, what are we to do? We are to tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, we're telling the good news. What's good news? The gospel of Jesus Christ. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability that God giveth. In other words, he's going to give us the strength to minister. And we are required to do so. But in all things that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. And we can look over at Psalm. It is God that girded me with strength and maketh my way perfect. You see, we can have these storms of life. We can have these situations that come into our lives in a way that really takes us back. But we need to focus on the Lord. He gives us the power to minister. He's given me tremendous opportunities. Another reason that uh, I thank the Lord that He gave me cancer. He has given me opportunities that I never dreamed of. But He's taught me to do it in His strength and His strength alone. You see, we can all have comfort and peace in the storms of life because we have a God who is omniscient. Um, omniscient. He knows where I am. He's omnipresent. He's with me at all times. And He's omnipotent. He has the power to see us through those storms. Let's bow our heads, if you would. You know the talk, the testimony I have given has been basically one for Christians, ones who know Christ as Savior. In talking with your pastor, he has said that he feels that most, if not all of you, are Christians. But you know something that I realized there on St. Andrews as well as other times? Only God and you know if you are a genuine Christian. I trust every one of you are, but I think I would be remiss if I didn't encourage you to search your heart, to, to be assured that you know the God of peace. You see, if you don't know the God of peace, you cannot have peace within these storms. I would encourage you to talk to the Lord right now. And I would encourage you, if you don't know the Lord Jesus as your own personal Savior, I would encourage you, either right now or when we finish our prayer, go back there and talk with your pastor. Let him show you how you too can have salvation. How you too can have peace in all the storms because you have a personal relationship with the God of peace. You know, there may be other things. Maybe you aren't serving the Lord the way He expects you to serve Him. Maybe, maybe you have slacked off in your witness for the Lord. Maybe you slacked off in your daily living for the Lord. I would not leave here I would challenge you to not leave here until you've made that decision. I understand there will be prayer partners in the back after it's finished there. I would encourage you to go talk to them and to just share any decision you might have with them. Dear Lord, we do thank you that you are a God of peace, that you are a God of comfort, that you are a God who takes care of us in the middle of the storms. We all recognize, dear Lord, that you aren't going to prevent the storms, though you can. We know that you allow the storms to take place in our lives. 
And oh Lord, we pray that you would help each one of us to, when we face those storms, to put our focus on you, to depend on you, to, to let your peace and let your strength be our guide. We pray if there's anyone in here today who needs to make a decision for you, we pray that they would not leave here until they have done so. And Lord, most of all, we want to thank you, praise you for everything that you have done in our lives. And we would not forget to give you all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise for everything you've done for us. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.